intervention of the hot new topic in the United States uh, is uh, a humanitarian intervention. Uh, you're no longer going to save the world from uh, fascism or Osama bin Laden or whatever. Uh, now it's, we've got the, it's women's rights. That's how the Afghan war was sold to the American public. We're doing it so that girls can go to school. Uh, that was not, in fact, the case, but uh, that's how it was marketed. The uh, Americans are a very generous giving people. Per capita, uh, Americans give more money to charity than anybody else, even the Muslims who face our uh, and, and Americans like this. They, they like to feel they're helping. Uh, starving people, blind, abused women, fighting disease. And they are doing very, very good work in many parts of the world. But the interventions that we've seen, for example, in Libya and in Syria were sold to the public. We've got to stop the massacre of the innocent people who we've been stirring up an army. Uh, US, French, and British special forces were active in the fighting in Libya. You know, all those tanks knocked out and things on the ground were done by Western Special Forces. Same thing in Syria. Uh, but this was kept from the American public and the media went along with this deception uh, so that the American public still felt that this was a generous thing to do. Uh, we see another uh, motivation. I'm trying to get at why is the United States uh, active uh, internationally, so active? Well, uh, America, you know, America is a very inward-looking nation. It's such a big country that uh, there are certain countries that are called planetary nations. United States, Brazil, India, China. They're so big that if the rest of the world flew away and disappeared tomorrow, no one would notice for a couple of months. Uh, and the Americans, you know, are often uh, ridiculed and laughed at because they don't know much about the outside of the world. And it's true. Once you get away from the, the oceans, from the West Coast or the East Coast, people are very poorly informed. They're poorly educated and they're poorly informed. And they get most, Americans get most of their news from uh, poor sources. Fox TV, which is, which is uh, makes them so get proud to look like a fair and honest reporting. Uh, millions of Americans get their news from Christian radio stations, uh, whose news is very, very biased, uh, very hostile, particularly to the Muslim world. Uh, and from crank politicians, demagogue politicians, and from special interests who have special interests to serve. So Americans really don't understand it. You know, my story about dinner and Aspen, we'll try and explain to 310 million Americans uh, what's, what's happening in, in Somalia. Uh, it's simply impossible because these are people with no sense of history and no sense of geography. Poll was taken when Americans were screaming about Libya, oh, we've got to do this, got to do that. They, 90 percent of the people who were queried, so we've got to do something about Libya. Couldn't find Libya on the map. So this is this is what we are dealing with in the states. Uh, then you have the, uh, the the government, and we have a faction of the government, the American. Uh, American foreign policy used to be run by the State Department. I almost went in the State Department. Uh, it, uh, it had professionals. It had people who knew these countries that they were talking about, and lived there, so sometimes spoke the language. But in the recent decades, certainly since 9-11, American foreign policy has become 
very little to rise. And it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. Now, I've, I've lectured at the Pentagon, and I've seen these people are very serious there. And they're not dummies. They, uh, they, know, they know a lot about foreign affairs. They know what they're doing. And they're making a major effort to educate themselves and to have area specialists. And I noticed that with the, the new American Africa Command, first time I've seen one of the American commands that has State Department officers uh, in the organization uh, to be able to advise and tell them, to, uh, give them a uh, little direction. Uh, the, the military is, is, is really on the march in the United States. You have to understand that after 9-11, the President George W. Bush doubled the military budget. And they had so much money now, yet you know, the people are looking for missions. So the military is, is trying to find something for it to do. The American military, I refuse to call it the defense budget, it's the military budget, is officially $700 billion a year. In reality, it's about a, a, a trillion when you conclude other programs. That's 50, almost 50% 50 of world military spending is spent by the Pentagon. It's the largest employer in the United States. The, and America, if you add in America's other leading allies, like Germany, and France, and Japan, etc., that they account for 80% of world defense, uh, military spending. Uh, it's an enormous amount, and it's completely out of control in the United States. And then, you know, as the country now has a $16 trillion debt and uh, is, 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 is running on borrowed money from Japan and China, the, the military spending just goes on and on. It's like the chariot of the juggernaut in Hindu mythology. It just rolls on, can't stop it. One of the reasons is that the American military defense industry, what President Eisenhower warned about 50 years ago, the military industrial complex. Our last great president, in my view, Eisenhower, he warned, he said, it must be curbed. 50 years later, it's still roaring along. And what the defense industry has done is when the government orders a new war plan, like an F-35, Stealth fighter. Uh, they make sure that all the parts are, are spread out, all the manufacturing work is spread out across the country. So uh, the mission then gets the wheels, and uh, Arizona gets some flaps, and California gets the body, and so on and so forth. So that every time there's an effort to cut military spending, the congressmen from these states go, oh, no, 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 you're cutting jobs, the our people are going to starve. And they had a huge uproar, and they had blocked the thing in Congress. So the, the military industrial complex has got an absolutely uh, uh, unattackable position. It's very, very hard to cut it. It's funny, and then, then, then there's always a new crisis. The Iranians, oh my god, the Iranians are going to be attacking us soon. Uh, uh, you know, the Somalis are coming. Uh, there's always a new boogeyman who comes up on the horizon. I'm not saying that this is all a nefarious plot. Uh, Americans really feel this way. America has major responsibilities or interests around the world. America was attacked on 9-11. America has many enemies in every world, but nevertheless, we live in a sense of national panic that's spread by the American media. And uh, it was Osama bin Laden. Uh, it was Saddam Hussein. It was uh, Ahmadinejad. Before that, it was Nasser. I remember Anthony Eden used to call him a Hitler on the Nile. Uh, it was uh, Mossadegh in Iran. And uh, Arafat and Gaddafi, who Reagan called him a man of the Middle East. Uh, every five years or so, there's a new Muslim boogeyman who jumps up out of the woodwork. Uh, Ahmadinejad, uh, now he's gone. I don't know, the job is open. Uh, they're, they're looking for volunteers. I'm sure somebody will come up along the line. But, uh, you know, Americans, the, the, the American 
mother who's so poorly educated, knowledgeable, good-hearted, yes, honest, yes, but, but unknowing. Uh, to sell them intervention somewhere, Somalia, let's say, uh, you can't start explaining about the different tribes and the clans and the history and Sheikh Mahmoud in 1750. It, 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 it doesn't work. I even know that as a columnist. It's too much to put into one column. Uh, so you have to come up with one figure, uh, Ahmed the Devil, and, uh, and claims massacre of children, and that's how you sell the operation. Look, the British, during the British Empire, the British did the same thing. They invented this practically. They, their event interventions in Africa and Asia were to bring the light of Christianity to the backwards heathen countries, to stop the exploitation of women and children, to stop slavery. Christian values, well, we don't use that line anymore, but we still uh, have a role. Look, I'm running out of time. I want to address quickly two other points. Well, sorry, one other thing. In the States, we have something that is not clearly seen from here. In fact, it's not even clearly seen from New York City. And that is in the heartland of the United States. Those are the states that are far away from the ocean. Uh, Alabama, North Dakota, Nebraska, Mississippi, all these places. We New Yorkers were terrible snobs. We call it flyover country. Like it's the you fly over there when you're going to San Francisco or Los Angeles, which you never go there. Even flyover country is a very powerful Christian fundamentalist movement that has risen up. Americans are among the most religious people in the world. And they, the right-wing Christians are now uh, one of the dominant political forces in the United States. Uh, they, these are fundamentalist Christians who, I call, we call them holy rollers in, in New York as they go into trances and they roll around on the floor. But they're not about what they call evangelical born and Christians. They believe that, uh, the, that the, the Savior, the Messiah, will not come back until biblical Israel is recreated in its biblical size. And then the Messiah will come and there will be Armageddon, which is the destruction of the world, and only the Oregon Christians will survive. All the rest of us are going to be burned alive. There are 44% to 50% of all people who vote for the Republican Party in the United States are evangelical born-again Christians of uh, varying degrees of, of intensity. And uh, amongst them are a large group of Christian Zionists. Uh, I saw them begin in Lebanon in the 1980s. And these people are the most militant. They make the Israeli Likud Party look like Christian scientists. They uh, determine that God won't come back unless we create a greater Israel, biblical Israel, with Zion, etc. So they are, and they've been, they've been shamelessly used by the Israelis to pressure Congress. So what they've done, in effect, is they've taken over the Republican Party. In the United States now, we, uh, the system has been paralyzed to the point where primaries determine who gets elected, not the general election anymore. Because the voting districts have been rigged. We call it gerrymandering in the states. So that uh, the Republicans will, it's a, well, they call it a safe seat in England. Uh, so what counts is who wins the primary. And in this case, the people who turn out for the primary are religious fanatics. They're the ones who are angry. Most of us have never brought up a primary. But the religious people turn to the good people do. So their influence is huge. And the Republican Party is in the group of these religious fundamentalists who are very much the hate Muslim world. They turn on the religious TV on Sunday mornings and flip through the dials watching these awful Preachers fulminating against Islam is the religion of the devil. Oh, they, they're planning a world caliphate to take us over. They're coming to cut our heads off. And unbelievable stuff. Uh, and it's generated a huge amount 
both anti-Islamic sentiment in the United States, as well as Europe, too. Uh, so the, the Republican Party is held by these people. You have the pro-Israeli group, which is tremendously powerful. Uh, this wonderful Israeli writer, Uri Abneri, a great man, uh, said, one of them, he said, if the Israelis were to Congress to repeal the Ten Commandments, they would. Uh, that's how influential it is. So, and, but on the other side, of course, you don't have anybody, you know, saying, let's be nice in the Muslim world, let's have better understanding that. Uh, so there were a lot of pressure, most of it in the wrong direction. We come finally to, uh, I just want to have part of the words on uh, Afghanistan. I was there, of course, with the Mujahideen in the 1980s, in the great jihad against the Soviets. Uh, I saw the courage of the Afghan people. Uh, I've written a number of times that the greatest men I've ever seen were the Afghans in Chechnya. Afghanistan has been destroyed. It will never be put back together again. Uh, the Americans say they're pulling out like hope we are, but they don't believe it. There will be, I don't know, 14, 15,000 American troops and thousands of mercenary troops left there. Uh, there is all kinds of tribal conflicts between the, uh, between the Mashum, uh, the South, and the tribes in the North. Uh, the Tajiks, particularly, uh, will be supported by outside powers. It, it, the civil war will just roll on the poor Afghanistan that's been tortured for 30 years. Uh, Pakistan is a total mess as well, and the Americans cannot wage war in Afghanistan without using Pakistan. So as long as the Americans have military interests there, they're going to make sure that they effectively control what's going on in Pakistan. That's a subject for all the lecture I write in Pakistan newspapers. And uh, Pakistan is in the midst of a great crisis. Things will get worse in Pakistan before they get better. Iran, finally, uh, we're at a really important moment right now in the future of the Middle East uh, as Iran has made an enormous gesture uh, by offering to uh, agree to demands to supervise, control, regulate its nuclear industry that uh, the West has been making for a decade. The Iranians have finally uh, done a sneaky maneuver of agreeing. And now that's throwing the Western powers into confusion. Uh, we saw just a few days ago how the French, uh, uh, in response to political pressure from the pro-Israeli community in, in France, suddenly tried to sabotage the deal by bringing in more demands. We saw the French, French president today, François Hollande, uh, had the nerve to say uh, that uh, we are totally against nuclear proliferation. We won't allow it. Well, it was France that gave Israel its nuclear industry, and its reactors, and its nuclear weapons, and its missiles. Uh, so that's a hell of a lot of nerve to say that. The point is that the United States now has to decide. Agree with Iran's proposals, which are sensible, and will end any kind of threat of Iran developing nuclear weapons. Uh, but that means lifting the blockade of Iran. And if the blockade is, is lifted, that means that Iran will start growing stronger and become a, a, a more important Middle power. And that the Islamic Republic will be legitimized as a legitimate government. And the Americans want to deal, but they don't want this to happen. They never accepted the legitimacy of the presence of the Islamic government. And in one of them, except the Cuba. So, uh, will you just continue its efforts to overthrow the Iranian government, or will it make a nuclear deal? We're this close to something happening with the powerful, powerful forces in the states, praise for all uh, Congress is passing all kinds of resolutions putting more sanctions on Iran. 
um, Congress is answering the calls from Israel. So we've got the Israeli government, we've got the Obama, weak Obama government in Washington, we've got the foreign powers in Iran, all of a very confused situation. We don't know what's going to happen yet. But uh, if they make a deal, it would be very good. Uh, but uh, their the opposition is going to be very, very heavy. So I leave you with the thoughts of the many possibilities, positive possibilities now, but uh, there are even more negative ones. America is very confused. Uh, no one is really in charge in Washington. That's one of the big problems. You know, we think America's this monolithic power. America's going to do this. America's going to do that. You've got the White House, which is very weak and, and losing power by the day. You've got Congress, which is so corrupt. It has all kinds of special interests with Broad, including Wall Street. Uh, you've got the military. You've got the military industrial complex. You've got the evangelical Christians. Uh, you don't know really, they're all pushing for different policies, hence the confusion coming out of Washington. Uh, and it's unfortunate that the fake countries around the world have to, have to, are going to be determined in such a confusion of the process. Anyway, I always think, well, the old Soviet Union was a much more reliable and dependable adversary. You would have to deal with them today. All bets are off, we don't know. Thank you very much.